Hey everyone, welcome back to Q&A with your CFA Q2 edition. I think that's what we agreed on calling it. Uh, we got me, John Kennedy here, and our famous Michael Scott. Michael, say hello to the fans. Hey everyone, yeah, John, I think I think we did agree on Q&A with CFA, but it's been a while since we've done one of these. Uh, I think, did we do one for the first quarter? I can't remember. It's been a while. Well, so we did and we didn't. What we called it then was uh, we spent a lot of time talking about the banking crisis. Yes. So it wasn't yes. like a true quarterly recap. And actually in the in the pre-call when you and I were planning for this, I think we're kind of more calling this like a, a half year recap. Um, so not in the conventional sense, no, but this one will be more back to the norm of what uh, our clients are used to seeing from us. And I think the beauty of these conversations are, you know, it, we have a lot of these discussions in client meetings throughout the year, but this is really, it's a nice opportunity now right here at the beginning of Q3 to talk about everything that's happened for the first half of the year and then get some of your insight um, as our resident in-house CFA on thoughts going forward. Um, obviously, we're not going to ask you to look in your crystal ball and tell us what you think the markets are going to do because that would be not a fair thing to ask of anybody. Um, but I do like asking you those <laughs> hard questions that. sometimes. So let's maybe um, let's let's kick it off with just give us a little bit of of highlights over this past quarter and and you know half year. I think the big thing that has been on everybody's radar, certainly I know it's been conversations in every meeting I've been involved in, is is what's going on with the Federal Reserve. Interest rate hikes, are we pausing? Are we at the end? Are they going to start lowering rates? Which has been funny articles I've been reading recently. So let's uh, let's maybe start there. Does that sound like a good place? Yeah, let's definitely start there. And, and like you said, with all of our, our clients, we have these conversations regularly. So some of this may be repeated if, if we've met recently or not, but it's a good, good time to kind of bring everything together and give a, a quick half year update. So you know, starting out for the year, um, three major stock indices that people look at, you know, the Dow, the NASDAQ, the S&P, they're all positive. The Dow is slightly positive, somewhere around 3%. s and up 15 to 16% for the first half of the year. And the NASDAQ's leading the way up about 30, a little bit over 30% for the first half of the year. And when I put those numbers out there, it's important to put that with a backdrop of what happened last year. Right, because last year that was almost completely reversed, where the Dow was down the least, the S and P was down about sixteen or so percent for the year, and the Nasdaq was down twenty eight, twenty nine, thirty percent for the year. And these are approximations. Don't quote me perfectly on those numbers, but it's kind of an. Won't hold you to it. Yeah, don't hold me to it. Um, those numbers are are almost a mirror opposite of the way they were a year ago, or way twenty two ended. And it's interesting um, because, you know, if the NASDAQ is down 30% yes, last year and it's up 30% this year, um, those are the same numbers, but that doesn't mean the index is, has broken even, right? Yeah. Because if you, if you go down 30, going up 30 isn't the same. So um, even though the market's been having a good year, a lot of investors may be looking at it and say, well, my portfolio hasn't broken even yet. Or... Um, you know, we we haven't got back to that high water mark, and that's true. And we still have some some ways to go, but so far, the year's been pretty good. But it hasn't been without its share of surprises and different things that have happened this year. Can I ask a silly question uh, mm -hmm. before we shift gears? And I, I know the answer to it, but I want to hear your I want to hear your response for our community of clients that listen to this. So it's interesting thinking about. Like you always see the Dow as like the headline of like, oh, Dow's down a thousand, up a thousand, whatever's going on. And, and that's sort of the, the makes the, the news. And talk a little bit about the differences between the Dow and the S&P 500, because it's pretty interesting to see such a difference in, in uh, total return for the year, I guess. So you said the Dow's around 3%, the S&P's around 15 to 16 year to day as of recording this conversation. Yep. you just explain to everybody listening to this the differences between those two and, and your thoughts on that? Yeah, we could talk. We could have a 45 to 60 minute <laughs> conversation. We promise to keep this like 20, so we won't yeah, do between that. Between these two, two indices. But the S&P 500 is, a, a, is the 498 or so largest U.S. companies. And it may be 502. It's, there's some interesting things in there because... 
Google has two share classes and there's a couple different things that are going on. So it's not actually 500 companies, right? But um, it takes the 500 or so largest US companies that are publicly traded and it puts them into a bucket and it weights them based on their market capitalization, right? Um, and what that basically means is how many shares they have outstanding multiplied by their stock price gives you its market cap. So Apple, for example, has a market cap today of about three trillion. So it makes up the largest part of the S and P five hundred. And then like Microsoft is right behind it, and those two together are something like thirteen to fifteen percent of that index itself, right? And then you just you go down and, you know, your visas are in there, United Healthcare is in there, down to, you know, Cisco, down to Discover Financial and different banks are in there. Right. So we have companies from the absolute largest to still large companies, but much smaller than Apple. Right. The Dow, on the other hand, is handpicked by um, a, a board and it's 30 companies. And this one's weighted differently. It's actually what's called a price weighted index. So, um, for example, United Healthcare has a stock price four hundred and fifty, four hundred seventy five dollars a share, somewhere around there right now. Um, that's one of the largest pieces of the Dow, mm -hmm. and it's handpicked and it's weighted by sectors to mirror the S and P. But you get two or three different companies to make up that weighting based on their stock prices. And mm -hmm. we can get into the depths of the depths of that. Right. But if you look at the Dow, Amazon's not in the Dow, but it's, you know, one of the biggest companies in, in, in the U S Google, not in the Dow. Yeah. Um, and you would really have to um, change the constituencies of the Dow to get it to mirror the S and P. And because of the way the Dow is constructed, it also has a bigger tilt towards value companies. So mm -hmm. when you look at like the, the tech part of the Dow, you have like Cisco, you have Apple, um, you've got Microsoft and, and a couple other companies like that. And I, I think IBM might even be in there as well, or was at one point. You don't have the NVIDIAs, the Facebooks, the, the different companies that you see in the S&P that have been, really been moving that this year. Yeah. So when we see this massive disparity in years like this, you can see um, why when certain companies have had good runs like Apple and Microsoft, Facebook, these companies are all massively, well, they, they may or may not actually be in the Dow. They may not be reflected in that. Yeah, that, that's, that's the perfect answer. I mean, so not only is it weighted differently, but then on top of that, we're talking about approximately 500 companies versus 30. That and, are handpicked and, because right. of their price. Like it, it, exactly. The Dow is, is famous because it was one of the initial ones, but it's not, it, it's really not the best look necessarily at, right. at the, at, at the U S economy. And that's not to say that the S and P is the best because that only looks at the large caps, right? Exactly. Right. There's a thousand other companies out there that are publicly traded and no one indice is probably the best gauge for the market. But these are the three, including the NASDAQ that we, we look at the most. Thanks for explaining that. I, I really wanted I, I wanted anyone listening to this, and we and again we talk about this in client meetings, but I wanted them to understand, okay, that's a pretty big variance between the return of one versus the other. Why might that be? And you answer that perfectly. So if we can, let's maybe go back to let's talk a little bit about inflation and the Federal Reserve. Interest rates are uh, seemingly at near the end. That's been a lot of the the conversation we've been having. How are we feeling about everything that's transpired with the Fed, interest rates, and inflation? No big deal. Just an easy, non-loaded <laughs> question whatsoever. Easy wants to go over, you know, and try to keep <laughs> this in 20 minutes, right? Um, it, you know, it, it's one of these situations where, and anything can happen in the future. And this is not a guarantee by any means. But the way this year has transpired, it almost feels like the soft landing might be achieved by the Fed. And the Fed's not very good at achieving a soft landing, right? Mm -hmm. And why do I say that? Well, this morning, we just had a, a new inflation report come out, right? 3% on the CPI year over year. Um, we were at nine something last year. That, that is fantastic. The target is two. We are so much closer 
Um, and that being said, the U.S. economy, according to the GDP forecast, the first quarter um, was positive. The second quarter is trending positive as well. So the economy is growing. Inflation is coming down. And the Federal Reserve is looking at this and they're saying that the monetary conditions are restrictive, meaning they're they're applying brakes to the economy as opposed to stepping on the gas. And assuming that they get this right, and that's a big assuming, <laughs> right? You know, you we could in theory land this plane into a soft landing, right? And, and that's that's their goal. Um, and when we dig into inflation, CPI is not necessarily just like the stock market indices doesn't tell the whole story, right? Because there are things within CPI that are widely variable. So commonly we'd look at something like core CPI, which is we remove food and energy. And why do we do that? Well, think about where energy prices were last year. I think oil was above $120 a barrel about this time last year. It was triple digits. And we're down into the 70s, high 60s right now. Um, that has downward pressure on CPI. Yeah. And that's that's bringing down inflation. And as well, you know, I know eggs aren't as cheap as they were three years ago, but they're cheaper than they were last year. I think my eggs cost me like $5 as opposed to eight six months ago. So, you know, those prices are built in. Um, what's concerning, and there's two areas that are concerning, um, to the Fed. One is shelter cost. So shelter is um, defined in, in the CPI book by um, rents and owner equivalent rent. And rent makes sense, right? If you go to rent an apartment, everyone that's renting apartment knows that their apartment costs more than it did last year. But those we're beginning to see taper off and the those numbers are lagged by about 12 months in the, in the way this, the calculation takes place. And we're seeing those numbers over the past six months have been coming down. And now we're seeing that effect in rent and it's coming down. The other piece of shelter is very confusing and I really don't like it. A lot of economists don't like it. It's called owner's equivalent rent. And John, let me like, this is a, a crazy question, but Generally speaking, your mortgage payment doesn't change every year, right? Correct. You know, there may be some changes if you escrow your um, insurance and that changes, right? But, but principal and interest stays yeah. fixed. Your well, principal. The amount, the total amount stays fixed. Yes, right. That, 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 that piece, that payment should stay fixed, right? Owner's equivalent rent attempts to look at your mortgage payment and say, what would that be if you were to rent your home today at the market value? Or if you were going to okay. rent out your home? And obviously, you know, home prices have gone up in most areas. So your rent would be higher than what your mortgage payment is today. Mm -hmm. And that nebulous number is put into the calculation. But you don't actually pay that difference, right? So that's, it's a very controversial piece of the shelter pricing. But it, it does help capture increase in real estate pricing. So there's pros and cons to it. But that piece of inflation has stayed stubbornly high, which has kept core up. Um, but that's beginning to roll over um, and, and come down. And the last piece of inflation that's really been concerning is um, the Fed has developed as well as, okay, well, we know food and energy is volatile, so let's back that out. And we know that rent is lagged and owner's equivalent rent isn't great. So like, let's back that out. So then we have what's called super core. And super core is, <laughs> I know this is very technical terms for the government. I didn't make this up, but they call it the super core inflation. Um, that piece is a little bit higher than what we want. But when you dig into those numbers, what's high there? Well, home insurance, auto insurance, um, airline travel stuff. And when we think about that, well, we all experienced the past two years, our real estate prices going up. And we all looked and loved the fact that we have so much equity in our home. And like, that's great. But now the insurance companies have caught up and realized that the insurable value of that home is higher. So mm -hmm. you're paying higher to insure the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that lags generally as well. 
and right. that piece is catching up. And it's, it's a very uncomfortable thing because you're like, I'm paying more to insure my home and nothing's changed about my home. Mm -hmm. But we all forget that we, we picked up so much value in our home as well over time. Sure. Um, sure. And, and that that's definitely frustrating from a consumer standpoint, but that's putting upward pressure on the inflation numbers. But even then, we don't expect real estate prices to scream up like they did two years ago. Um, in a lot of markets, we kind of think they might be drifting a little bit lower. So that effect should come out. And when you when you remove those kind of things, you're like, well, inflation isn't that high anymore. Now, Amazing. it was not painful to go through. It was painful to go through last year, but it was this year we're plateauing there. And that's kind of why the Fed is nearing the end of their hiking cycle. How does this, uh, this is an interesting thought, but how does any of this affect the banking system? And I guess really what I'm trying to get to with this question is, do we as consumers need to continue to feel unsettled about this whole banking issue that we've seen over the period of months? And obviously, we, we've done a lot of work to educate our clients on maybe why they don't need to be. But what are what are some of your thoughts there as this ties into everything that's happened over the period of months with banking? Yeah, so it's a complicated question. And, I'm, good and at, I'm good at asking them. I'm not good at answering them. Let me let me let me put it out this quickly. Consumers should not worry about their bank, right? We've never broken the FDIC guarantee for different reasons, whether the government paid for it or the banks paid for it or the government negotiated bailouts, whatever. Consumers haven't been hurt by losing money in a bank. Like deposits haven't gone away. Consumers Correct. have been hurt by bank stocks, but deposits haven't been lost, right? And I foresee that not to be a problem moving forward. Now, how do how does all this affect the banks? Well, if interest rates continue to go up, right? And we think they will go up in July. But let's say for whatever reason, the Federal Reserve hiked five more times into the sixes and to the sevens. Well, I don't know about you, but my mortgage is at 2.7% for 30 years. So my mortgage is underwater for the bank. Mm -hmm. You know, if interest rates were to continue to go up, the value of my mortgage is going to continue to go down on mm -hmm. their books. To and, them, and right. To them, right. And it, this is a paper thing and this is an accounting problem. Um, that could potentially be an issue. Uh, but we've seen... and the March situation has become so apparent that the Fed is now testing that. You know, interestingly before the Fed test tested what happened in a, you know, 08 global financial crisis where we push rates to zero and there's credit dries up and there's no consumer demand. They weren't really testing what happens if we raise rates by 500 basis points because it didn't happen. Yeah, and right. now we're testing it, and 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 banks look to be handling that well. There are ways to hedge that risk. There's ways to maneuver through that, and we don't think we're going to see an issue like that again because governance should be taking care of this now. And I say governance on the on the corporate level. the 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 federal government probably should have some oversight, but really, you know, this is how banks manage their exposure. Mm -hmm. What we could see as far as volatility in the banks for the second half of the year into 2024 is, is, is corporate real estate. Mm -hmm. There's some concerns in larger cities that um, leases aren't uh, being filled and the value of a real estate, corporate real estate building in San Francisco isn't what it is, what it is not worth today what it was last year. So the loan that's attached to that isn't as stable, right? There's some concerns about that. But like we said before with leases, leases and those payments, they don't all come due at the same time. It's not like every building in the United States has to be refinanced in August or in every city. They're going to be refinanced over the coming years. 
And there may be some banks that have too much exposure to that market and there may be some volatility there. But these are not the JP Morgan's, the systematically important banks uh, of the country. They're, yeah. they're smaller and it will be unfortunate when it happens to them if something does happen. But we should not see a run from depositors on that type of a bank. Sure. You mentioned the word volatility, which is my one of my most commonly used words, uh, I feel, in these last several years as it mm-hmm. relates to the market. My, probably my least favorite word, but most commonly used. And well, I think it's interesting halfway through this year and everything we've just talked about in the last 20 minutes, uh, I, I'm not sure that I would have expected us to be where we are, let's say, in even the S&P 500, for example. Um, and yet here we are. And so I know that we expect to see volatility if I apply that word back to the markets and portfolios and that type of thing. You, uh, When we discussed this conversation, I really loved the theme that you want to apply to this. So I'm going to let you talk about that. Um, just the overall idea of resiliency um, mm-hmm. here halfway through the year. Can we talk about maybe some... So you you talked about the the you know corporate real estate and the in and that type of thing, but let's let's bring that conversation full circle to volatility, um, maybe back to the markets and and what you think you know we see for the rest of the year and what our theme should be. Yeah, you know, <laughs> volatility is that word that it gets thrown around all the time to describe stocks because or the markets because it goes hand in hand. The markets over time history has shown us that they go up and to the left, meaning that they, they gain value over time. But that is not a straight line. And very rarely does that occur in a straight line scenario. They go up and down every year. And there's a lot of studies on this to show like what the average drop is every year, but what the average return is over time. Um, you know, the unfortunate thing is that a lot of people lose the way when the markets go down, they get discouraged because, you know, you can see, you can be plotting along getting seven or 8% a year and then lose 30% in a single year. And you feel like you wiped out the past five years of gains and on paper you have, right? But things come back because the economy rebounds and then you're resetting from a higher level and and you, you begin that climb again. And that plays a, massive toll on people. And when we think about the past three years, right? Like we had the COVID situation, lockdowns, I say situation, we, we had COVID going on and that played a major toll on people, whether that was just emotional or mental or, or, or you lost your job or you changed jobs, like that was a toll. And then we get in 2021 and we think we're getting past that. We're opening up and suddenly near the end of the year, we're staring down like inflation to 2022. And even though maybe our homes increased in value and our stock portfolios went up and we're beginning to see wages go up across the board in a meaningful way that hasn't occurred in the past 10 years on a large scale. Well, now we deal with inflation and the markets drop 20, 20% in a year, right? That's, that's tough. Um, and it takes a resilient person to get through that. And when we look at, you know, what's 2023 been, it's been a uh, description or a play out of what resiliency looks like. You know, the consumer by and large has weathered the inflationary storm very well. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've continued spending. And there's a lot of theories on that. But household debt is lower. That's bad. Leverage is lower than in 2008. But we have higher inflation. You know, we're mm-hmm. we're spending more money, um, but we're in a better financial position to do so. Um, and when we think about what that's done for the economy and portfolios, it's allowed them to rebound this year. And that's where that resiliency has come in. That both consumers have been resilient, businesses have been resilient, and now we're getting to potentially that end of the tunnel where inflation is going to level off, and Fed rate hikes are about done. We think. Right, anything can change, um, but we're kind of optimistic about the state of the economy. That does not mean that we're guaranteeing a ten percent upswing in the markets from here, or there's a green light, right? Um, because sometimes the markets, and the economy move at different paces. But 
the market, consumers, businesses, we've all been relatively resilient in the face of everything that's happened, not only this year or last year, but going back the past, you know, three or four years at this point. Um, and it kind of just goes back to, you know, as an investor sticking to the plan and putting the plan in place, knowing that you're going to go through these cycles and the resiliency piece on your investing behavior is continue saving the 401k, continue saving in the IRA or your non-qualified account, sticking to the plan, even as you see the markets go up and down. Well said, Michael. I, I think what's cool for me is, I mean, these are, this is our joy. Our joy is having these types of discussions with clients, taking something <clears throat> that's very complicated and breaking it down that's under, to, to an understandable degree, helping a client redefine their relationship with money. And uh, certainly part of the reason that we do videos like this in between the, the meetings that we have is to provide that education and, and really just use this as a platform to have the conversation. So anyone listening to this uh, that's a client of ours. If you've got questions, you know certainly we'll provide the appropriate links to schedule even just an update call in between the review meeting cycle. Our, our review meeting cycle is really just an opportunity to stay proactive and make sure that we're having conversations, but we're open to and excited to always have conversations in between whatever you know the normal review meeting cycle might be. Um, you know, Michael, I I think I love the word resiliency as it relates to just the definition you provided over the last few minutes, thinking about going back to 2020, everything that's transpired in that time frame, and half the battle is to, to being resilient, I think is, is understanding what's going on and, and then making sure that, because to say to somebody like, hey, let's stick to your plan versus to have this awareness and understanding of what's happening so that they can get the why to stick to the plan, that's so huge. And that's what you're so good at doing in a lot of these meetings. So certainly appreciate you, Michael. Any parting uh, parting words of wisdom for our community of clients that are hanging with us today as we wrap? I think we've covered it a lot, man. I, I think yeah. what, I, what I take away from this, this year so far and looking into next year, um, volatility is going to remain, but resiliency is, is really that theme, right? And I, I feel like just telling people, hey, you have a plan, stick to it. Um, that's important, you know, for us to do and have the conversation with our clients. But also, you know, from a client's perspective, like that's hard. And yeah. recognizing that that's hard to do because we're emotional people uh, or, or investors are emotional. It's hard to stick to the plan. Uh, but keeping to it and being resilient in the face of everything that's going on really does lead to uh, positive outcomes. I love that. Well, I'm going to end with a quote. I don't know if you noticed me like Googling quotes as we were talking <laughs> just now. I did this. And it's that hardships often prepare ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. C.S. Lewis. So it's a good one, man. It, well, it, I feel like it ties into everything you're talking about with, with resiliency. Yep. So thanks for joining us uh, today, Michael, hang with us having this conversation. And everybody listening, like I said, we'll provide appropriate links to schedule update calls with one of us um, if you have any follow-up questions. But we love, we love doing this. We love having these conversations. So please take us up on that offer to have discussions in between meetings. And otherwise, we'll see you next quarter. See you. Bye, everybody.